You can get involved, 2146, that's your SMS line at Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. Let's get the conversation started there. For, now, let's introduce this next part. Well, Kenya's online food and beverage market is projected to reach 3.8 billion shillings by 2024, according to the latest food index report by Jumia. Now, the report states that the online food and beverage market, which is currently worth 1.8 billion shillings, is expected to witness a revenue increase of 20.1%, owing to increased online consumers. In the country, according to the report, which was released on the eve of the World Food Day, chicken was the most ordered food in the country in the period between March and August 2020, followed by burgers and pizza. But what has caused this index to go up? Now, looking at the performance of online food delivery, we are joined by Srinar Ruparella, the Chief Commercial Officer, Jumia Food. Srinar, how are you doing? Good morning, how are you? Happy to have you around. So, I'm, I mean, this report was also released at quite a time when everybody was saying there is a shift in the market from the way that we used to do things to where we are right now. Now with the COVID-19 pandemic came a new way of life that saw restaurants and eateries adopt new models of operation in order to stay afloat. How did Jumia plug or can I say peg itself on this shift? Sure. Uh, I mean, as you know, uh, Jumia is a online marketplace. We, you know, we connect our consumers with sellers um, and provide our logistics network, our automation. You know, we we basically are enablers that uh, you know provide the, these opportunities for businesses to come online. The COVID um, pandemic, uh, you know, came at an unpre was an unprecedented time. Uh, you know, it knows no borders, and we really had to um, think quickly on our feet. And and basically, what we did was, you know, we did a couple of things. One, we needed to unlock the supply chain so that governments and and institutions could access, you know, essential products. Um, for example, in Uganda, we worked with the UNDP where we got a lot of their farmers, uh, around 17 to 20 farmer groups, uh, trained them on how to access the online platform, trained them on pricing, on packaging, on logistics. And basically, you could buy your market vegetables online now. Uh, this was largely run by women and youth, and, and it really gave them an opportunity to sustain their livelihoods. So we really see ourselves as, as the enabler and, and sort of the last mile livelihood for a lot of businesses. For many of our restaurant partners who had to shut down their businesses, online platforms were the only way for them to, you know, keep their business afloat. Um, also, you know, with our riders, making sure that they are able to, you know, deliver contactless uh, using sanitizers, gloves, masks, also providing Jumia Pay as a form of um, cashless payments as governments were encouraging uh, the lack of, uh, you know, use, not using a lot of cash, uh, actual physical cash. Um, so, so these were some of the ways in which we felt we had a responsibility, you know, to support our communities, to support our existing partners, and to allow co consumers to stay safe at home and, and access the products that they need. Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you this, though, even as we talk about this report that you released. It, it could be bittersweet or it could be an area of concern from where everybody said it this morning. I mean, if you look at exactly what is ordered heavily, it is chicken was the most ordered food in the country, followed by pizza and burgers. Does that reflect the sort of demographics of people who use these online delivery services like Jumia now? Because well, you wouldn't say that this could be considered essential, good deal from what you said this morning. Well, I mean, uh, yes, you know, the, the, the reality is that, you know, the online and e-commerce penetration in Africa has really been increasing over the last couple of years. Now this has created opportunities for a lot of quick service restaurants uh, who serve these burgers and pizzas um, to set up shop. You know, the, this is what the middle class, you know, everyone is pretty busy and they want access to affordable food. They want access to convenient food. Um, and that was, that was the life before COVID. Now as COVID has entered our life, um, we are essential. And so we are actually seeing that whilst very young populations aged between 18 to you know 35 who are mobile savvy, who are internet savvy, Kenya having such a high penetration of internet, 
are already used to accessing and appreciating this convenience, we are seeing a shift of more and more uh, wider groups of demographic uh, people uh, coming online, wanting to have their local foods, uh, you know, uh, accessible online. So, for example, we see African cuisines and and I know it's a bit of a vague term, but, you know, Kenyan meals, uh, some of them I, I love as well, Italian meals, Chinese meals. So people are embracing online as their way to access even meals that they feel closest at home. Secondly, um, we are, we're also tapping into a different demographic, such as grocery delivery, which has become a very big um, it's been a big grow, growing um, category of ours over the last couple of months because households need access, you know, to their um, ungas and their rice and their daily staples. Um, but in addition to that, we've got water delivery, gas delivery. So we're really branching out into service lines and products that people need uh, affordably, conveniently delivered safely at home. And this is outside of the quick service restaurants, which is which is still very popular, but we're seeing more and more people embracing the online delivery space. Pretty much. All right, let's talk about what this says. I mean, from where you said it this morning, well, you will say that it has become as a blessing as disguise to companies like Jumia that sort of acted as a connector to whatever guidelines that were actually even given out by the Ministry of Health and all that. So the question that anybody would ask you, do you see this as a permanent shift, this growth that we're talking about in here? Is it a permanent shift or are we going to get to some level where we'll say, well, let's get back to what we used to do before? I mean, uh, yeah, you know, everyone wants a normalcy, you know, of, of some sorts to, yes. to go back. Yes. But I think what this has done is, is that it has, it's a mind shift change, you know. It's a mind shift change that has um, really gone from, uh, you know, public sector, government institutions, where they see the value of working with enablers like Jumia to really open up certain industries. Um, it means that there is a mind shift change across businesses where, you know, they can't just do what they used to do uh, within their business environment. Um, you know, the pandemic was unforeseen. No one was prepared for it. Uh, and so I think that there is a, and, and, and the point of the index is to support businesses with data points or, or to unlock some of those uh, uncertainties around the online marketplace that they may have. Uh, that That is the reason why we, we wanted to launch this index uh, across Africa and across all our markets to really educate consumers, businesses, governments on, you know, where is the opportunity and that this indeed can be incorporated into their day to day. So we're not saying that anything should stop from your norm, but it just means that you are, you know, diversifying your opportunities to grow. And more importantly, consumers, you know, that this is the shift, you know, Africa is the youngest population on the continent uh, across the world. You know, right now we are only at 2% penetration of e-commerce versus China that is upwards of 20% or, you know, the U.S. that is 12%. So there is a lot of latent opportunity here. Uh, and we're very confident that in the next couple of years, um, you know, this is going to grow. And, and certainly businesses, governments and consumers need to embrace it. Yes. I'm, I'm, I want to pick uh, what, your, what your prediction is uh, from this index. Because you're saying, well, well we see that um, the, the, food, the online food and beverage market more than doubling to 3.8 billion by 2024. And you're projecting your revenues to go by 20.1% annually for any other person who's in, in this space, therefore. But I want to ask you this question because, well, that said, the only part that's growing is on online retail in food and beverage industry. That, that's where you see the biggest jump even during this COVID-19 pandemic. So where are the opportunities? And I want you to answer from this perspective. Are we going to see you grow out of the cities to, to, to the other towns in East Africa and, and the region as well? Is that where the opportunities are? Because essentially, if you even look at development and, and, and settlements, then you'll actually even say that's where the populations are. So are you going to diversify out? Are you going to move out? Sure. I mean, right now, you know, in, in East Africa, we, we operate in Kenya and Uganda. And, yes. and in Kenya specifically, all our major cities. Um, I think one of the advantages of, of, of Jumia is that they indeed have 
a local spread. Uh, so we don't just operate our logistics within the urban city centers. But of course, you know, we want to allow the we, we want to give access to to more and more Kenyans yes. to the platform. I mean, this is where we've tested out some very valuable partnerships with Shofco, um, which, you know, which is a program based in Kibera. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, those local vendors have access, their products have access to the online marketplace. Um, this is the reason why we, we work with, you know, agencies like the UNDP in Uganda, because this is not the new norm. You know, a market seller, uh, you know, as you know, in any market uh, that, that we go to, you know, they they live you know, day to day, this is their produce, they need to sell it and, and that's it. But there's a lot more that we can do in terms of not only branching outside of the cities, but also developing the vendors that we have within our urban centers. And what I mean by this is, you know, working with the local vendors, training them, giving them access and explaining to them how the processes work, how can they be more competitive, how can they access more consumers, because that is the shift. And so it is our responsibility and we have the knowledge and the expertise to do so, but also through other programs such as virtual kitchens, for example, you know, how using our data points, how can current partners or restaurants or businesses, um, you know, go into areas without necessarily having to, you know, invest in, in actually building a physical restaurant, for example. You know, how can they create products uh, or, or food uh, cuisines that people want? You know, we're going into water deliveries, gas deliveries. So it's about bringing in new partners on board. It's about educating ones that are have, have never really understood or, or see the opportunity of marketplaces. And the third part is it's about growing our existing, uh, you know, partner base. Yes. That's so, where the opportunities are, I believe. Pretty much. So the point just paints a wowsy picture on exactly uh, what the growth in this space is actually going to be. But then I was going through it, but I didn't see anywhere what you say. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic effects, we would have expected that maybe it would have been 2025. Would you tell me, were you not affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Or it came as a blessing to you? Because if you look at other sectors of every other economy in the world right now, they're saying, well, we got to take it a bit further because of the COVID-19 pandemic. What would you say have been the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in this space? Sure, I'm just, it's breaking a little bit, so I'm trying to hear you closely. Um, so if I understand you correctly, you, you want to understand what uh, has really been the driver and the mover during the COVID pandemic, correct? Yes, and, and, uh, whether, and, and I don't know whether you can actually, okay. uh, and I don't know whether you can actually catch that now, because, well, your report paints a rousy picture, just a good picture of the opportunities and the growth in revenue and, and its size, but then... What would you say that this, is it pegged on what the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic has been? Would that fall back someone will ask you, has it just been positive? What is the negative of the pandemic in that? I mean, you know, like, to be honest, we, you know, when the, when the pandemic hits, I mean, as I, as I mentioned earlier, no one foresaw this, you know, it, it's unprecedented times, businesses changed, we had to rapidly, you know, change our business model overnight. And, and for example, you know, making sure all our riders are safe, safely delivering these, 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 these packages and, and food items. So making sure they have access to hand sanitizer, temperature checks every single day it, before they start their shifts and after, you know, they end their shift uh, using face masks, contactless deliveries. We have to do a ton of training with our riders. So first and foremost, it was important for us to protect our employees when the pandemic hit. And, and that meant that, you know, a lot, a lot of our teams were working from home. We are a technology company. You know, it's, it's very dynamic uh, in our offices. And then all of a sudden, overnight, we, we had to start working from home. That creates its own challenges. But over, over, over and above that, you know, the first important factor for us was to protect our employees, to put in place all the measures as per guidelines from the Ministry of Health and, and, and other government agencies. And that was the first part. The second part was making sure how are our consumers protected. So this is where our other channels of Jumia Pay certainly came handy because, you know, it meant that we are not only protecting our riders, but we're also protecting our employ uh, our customers to make sure that there is no transaction of physical cash. And that was very, very important. Um, and I think that in itself was a big enabler to making sure that that transaction between what consumers needed and what we had to offer was there. 
Then the third part was making sure that supply chains were, um, as you know, you know, only supermarkets were open up to certain points in the in the evening. You know, there were there were travel restrictions, so we had to obviously work very closely hand in hand with the ministries uh, and Ministry of Health. Make sure that those guidelines were not only adhered within our company and organization, but also our partners. So you know, for restaurants to be able to operate, or for grocery supermarkets that we were working with they had to also enforce these measures within their stores. And so we had to work very closely to transfer that knowledge, to, to kind of share the challenges that our partners are facing, that we're facing. So of course, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't all smooth sailing when, when, when the pandemic hit, but you know, we worked, I think that was the first time, I mean, you know, that I saw all actors in private and public sector coming together to really work together and solve this issue because you know the food and beverage industry is is a pretty important uh, sector in this country you know it is it is home to you know almost 35% of jobs that are created uh you know and and a lot of these sit within the the restaurant industry so it is a very it was a very vulnerable industry when the covid pandemic hit and so it was very important that you know all actors came together and we were able to support each other and, and unblock a lot of the challenges that we faced. Pretty much. Just as we clear this conversation this morning, therefore, just before you paint me a clear picture of exactly what sort of holds that Jumia wants to have on this sort of industry, even as we talk about um, just these growth opportunities, can you talk to me about what the penetration level in, in, in the adoption of your services has been? Would you say that you experienced a jump during the COVID-19 pandemic and what sort of culture perspectives have you had to fight with because everybody talks about how Africa the only thing you gotta do when you're taking technology to them is fight that culture would you point out some of those and exactly how you've been able to manage that Sure. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, as you, as you know, e-commerce penetration is less than two percent in Kenya. And and having said that, I think what has supported the growth is certainly going above and beyond our typical model of just delivering restaurant food. Uh, as I said, we launched into multiple other categories, so groceries, ga gas delivery, water delivery. Um, we we did a lot of that, so that became we became relevant and yes. essential yes. rather than just convenient. Um, so I think that's the first cultural change that happened. People recognized that their safety was was uh, was very, very important. It was very important for them to be at home with their loved ones. A and that actually it was easy. You know, as you know, you try once and you get good experience uh, as your first time. Customer experience for us is absolutely important. It is it is our Bible. It's what we you know, if we have a, a disgruntled customer, that that is not something that we we wish to have ever and so we do everything in our power to make sure that the last mile experience the experience for the notch and so that is what we paid our, our focused our attention on is really how can we improve our services to give the best customer first time customer experience because we recognized that a lot of people were were looking to us to access all these products safely at home so they don't have to go into a congested supermarket or a market um, or be be concerned about you know accessing a lot of these products uh, without leaving of their home so i think those were the cultural mind shifts for us internally but also as we we saw that as consumers uh felt that it was an easier test to make your payments uh, easily online through jumia pay accessing these products the deliveries that were contactless friendly riders you know, I felt that that trust we saw was the trust actually deepened with our consumers as well as our partners. And, and you know, that's something that is very difficult to crack in, uh, in, 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 in an African context because people are used to transacting when they see the product first, right? That's always been kind of the initial thinking of how people transact. Um, but I think now, you know, the, the reality is that, that times have changed and people are embracing other ways of accessing their products and that doesn't necessarily that you know they they able, they're able to see it on our app so i think those are the few instances of where we've seen a, a bit of a cultural change pretty much shrinal thank you very much for joining us this morning on a business app thank you so much on that note we take a short break once we come back our economic review this morning 2146 is on the sms line